seventh day, holy day. Now that happened at the beginning. At the same time, the Bible says that's the creation. The Bible says that there's a new creation now. And in the new creation is brought through Messiah. It's brought through Messiah on the cross and in the resurrection. That is the work of a new creation, a new birth, a new genesis, a new beginning. Now, since it's the same God and it's the same work of creation, of beginning, could there be a link between the two events, between the first creation and the new creation? The answer is yes. When did God finish the works of the creation? He did so on the sixth day. When did Messiah finish the work of the new creation, his labor? He did it on Friday. What is Friday? The sixth day. What was the day of the creation of man? The sixth day. What about the new creation of man? The sixth day. What is the day of the redemption of man? The sixth day. Same day that God created man. When does the crucifixion take place? Sixth day. And you look at the timing. And look at the way the first day began. When did the first day begin? In a sense, it was Sunday, though it wasn't called Sunday. Yom Rishon in Hebrew, that first day at the beginning of Genesis. When did it begin? It began at night. The Bible says always that it was first night and then it was day, the opposite of the way we think in the West. In the Hebrew calendar, it always begins at night. Every holiday, as you know, begins when the sun goes down. The sun goes down, it is Erev, it is evening. The new day begins. That's why it's not just because of the Hebrew holidays. Every day on the calendar is like that. It's just you note it when the Hebrew holiday comes up that you only start at sundown. So the first day, it, it, the reason why that is, is because it's in Genesis that way. That first there was evening, and then there was morning. So every Hebrew day begins at sunset of the day before and ends at sunset of the day after. So therefore, the sixth day is Friday, but when on the biblical calendar would the sixth day begin? Not Friday, but Thursday. It begins Thursday night. The sixth day begins at sundown on Thursday. Is that significant? Very. Because that's the exact time when, in a sense, the passion of Messiah begins. That sixth day begins Thursday night at sundown with what? With the beginning of the Passover Seder. It starts at sundown. It's the Last Supper. He's talking about his death. He is overseeing that meal that's all about his death. It's beginning on the day of man because he's going to die for the sins of man. And he's going to redeem man from the curse. So it all begins that way. You know, in the beginning, man, when he was created, was brought into a garden on the sixth day. On the sixth day of this new creation, Messiah is brought into the garden of Gethsemane. And there his death is prepared for. On the sixth day he is crucified. The sixth day. And in Hebrew, you know, again, night and then day. It has to go from sunset Thursday to sunset Friday. So the work of the redemption has to end before the sun goes down on the sixth day. That's why it ended when it did. He's on the cross for how many hours? Six hours. The number of man for the sins of man, for the redemption of man. And then at the sixth hour, he cries out, it is finished, which is Friday afternoon. The sun is going down. And then it goes down, and he is brought into the tomb and laid down. It's over. His works are over. And then comes what? Then comes the Shabbat, the Sabbath. What does he do on that seventh day? He rests. He rests in the tomb, just like God did at the beginning. God ceased from his works. He finished his works on the sixth day, rested on the seventh day. Messiah does the exact same thing. I mean, even in his death, he observes it all. You know, we look at the Sabbath, in the, the Orthodox and how they do it, and we see it only often as a burden, legalism, and that's often what it can become. But we tend to see it not really what it is. You know, the Sabbath is in its nature something beautiful. The Sabbath was made for man. You know, Sabbath is about shalom. It's about peace. It's about a peace that often many believers don't have. And I want you to open up to Hebrews 4 to put this together, Genesis and Hebrews 4. 
And in Hebrews 4 speaks also about the Shabbat, the Sabbath. And here's what it says. Verse 4. Hebrews 4, verse 4. And I love Hebrews. I love the way this talks. For he has said somewhere, doesn't tell you where, somewhere concerning the seventh day. God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall never enter into my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter in, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, again, he fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as it's been said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. If Joshua had given them rest, he wouldn't have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Shabbat, a Sabbath for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Therefore, let us be diligent to do what? To enter the Sabbath, the Shabbat. What it's saying is, there's a greater Sabbath yet to come. In a sense, the Sabbath was a foreshadow of the peace that God would bring because of Messiah. What does the Sabbath come from? It comes from Messiah. It is the Sabbath. It's no accident he died when he did. Already, all put in the tomb, and then the Sabbath comes. He always observed the Sabbath when he was alive. Now he observes it in his death, the holiest day. He had to die when he did. His labor had to be over because you don't work on the Sabbath. He is, he said, the Son of Man is the Adon HaShabbat. He is the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the day, the state of being that represents the peace of God, the shalom of God, the state of completion and rest and blessing. That's what it's about. And Messiah is Lord over that. He is the Lord of Shalom. He's the prince. It says he's the prince of peace. Sar Shalom in Hebrew. He's the master of Shalom. Peace comes from him or it doesn't come. He is the Lord of completion in what it means. He's the Lord of being full, fulfilled, and right, and blessed. The Lord of rest. In Messiah, you are to enter that place, this divine Shabbat Sabbath of God. But how? In the book of Hebrews, it's written, let us enter, let us labor to enter. It may take some work to get in. We're going to see that. So many believers live their lives in a state of restlessness, just like most of the world, and are not living in the Sabbath of God. But the secrets are there in Messiah's entrance. When Messiah died on the cross, he was not only dying on the cross, he was also entering the Sabbath. In the greatest Sabbath entrance that has ever been after the, the days of Genesis. What was the cross? It was the way he entered into the Shabbat. He labored to enter in. And so the amazing cool thing is, when you look at Messiah on the cross, you actually find keys of entering the peace of God for your life. And keys of entering the place in God where you can have completion and healing and fullness. Messiah, Lord of the Sabbath, teaches us how to enter the Sabbath on the cross because that's what he's doing. Aside from everything else, he's also entering the Sabbath. And I'm, we're going to look at a few of those keys tonight. It's really cool because you wouldn't think so. That's exactly what's happening. On the cross, John 19, 28, he says, I am thirsty. I am thirsty, quoting from the Psalms. Is there any key there about peace with God with that? Yes, there is. One of the things, one of the keys of having peace with God and peace in your life is you have to bring your needs to God. Whatever that is, as much as you don't, you're in trouble. And you'll never be at peace. As much as you pretend you don't have a need, you will never have peace with God. You know, as much as you try to fulfill your own need, you will never have peace with God. As much as you keep two worlds apart, hey, you know, at home I'm one way, I'm here and I'm pretending everything's fine in my life, and yet I have a real need. If you don't bring that to God, you're not going to have peace. You have a need for people to accept you. Listen, we know that's not the end. We shouldn't be there at the end. But if you have the need, don't pretend you don't have it. Bring it to God. You know, whatever the need is, you're lonely. Bring it to God. You know, it may even be, you know, you're tempted. Bring it to God is what it's saying. 
You have to bring your thirst to him, and you have to confess it if you're going to be touched, if you're going to have peace in your life. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened down, and I'll give you rest. And come to me, all you who are thirsty, come and drink. First thing is don't hide your need. People get into big trouble for doing that. And some of the great saints of God, I mean, David got into big trouble for keeping kind of two things in his life and pretending he didn't have that need. You know, God said, why don't you come to me? The thing is, whatever it is, even if you're, you're being tempted, that's a need. Bring it to God. God is never saying, don't bring it to me. I don't want to touch. He never says, I, don't, I won't deal with it. He'll deal with it. Bring it to God. And he's there. Next thing he says on the cross, another key to the Sabbath of God, of Messiah. Matthew 27, 45, he says, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. He speaks Aramaic, quoting from the Psalms in Aramaic. Eli, Eli, my God, my God, lama, why? Sabachthani, have you forsaken me? Now people argue and say, how could he be God if he's saying, my God, you've forsaken me? That's the awesome, awesome thing about the cross. It's God actually separating himself from himself so he could be one with us who are separated from God. And yet it's all that, and it's also part of the Sabbath entrance. I mean, you wouldn't expect a leader to say this publicly, and here of all people, Messiah, to say this, to say something like that, saying that God has separated, has forsaken him, and he's saying, why? But another next key related to the first, for you to have peace in, with God, peace in your life, is that come as you are. Bring everything, even the sin in your life, especially the sin, God wants it. The guilt, especially the guilt. I mean, he took all these things on the cross, and he already took your sin, so if you're holding on to your sin, you're a thief, because it belongs to him. You know, no matter what it is, maybe you think, that God promised you something that didn't happen in your life and you've been dealing with this and it's been separating you from God, until you get this out with God, you're not going to have peace. Even the separation from God, don't let that... Even Listen, if God himself is saying, God, why are you far from me? If God could separate from himself and still be God, that means that no matter how far you feel from God, you will, there's a way, doesn't matter what it is, even that won't separate you from God. You could have committed murder, and that still won't separate you from God if you bring it to God. It's just you don't feel him close. Bring it to him. You're mad at God. You ever been mad at God? Yes, of course you've been mad with God sometimes. The key is we know the end of the story is that God wins the argument. But the thing is, if you don't ever argue with him, he'll never win in your life. You understand? Jacob wrestled with God. And you have to, you're mad with God, bring it to God. It's okay. It's not going to shock him. Other people in the Bible were mad with him, about him. David was. Others were. You know, the thing is that God is used to that. But you've got to bring it to God. And at times you might even say, listen, I don't feel like, I remember a time when we were waiting, hoping for a particular building that fell through early on, and we had no other building. And I remember that that day when it fell through after a year, I was just, I said, God, I'm just not happy with you today. And I don't feel like talking to you today. But I was telling him that I didn't feel like talking to him. It was okay if you don't feel like talking to him as long as you tell him about it. What happened was, God then did the biggest miracle. The next day, he got us the, the building. But I had to get to that point. If I just didn't, you know, didn't deal with it, it not it. Lama, he says, why God? which means we don't have to understand everything, but still bring it to him. Why, God, I don't understand, but I don't have to understand everything, but this is what I'm feeling. Come as you are. No matter how distant you are from God, he's there with you also knowing what it is to be distant from God, even in that. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Even then, my God, you're still my God, even though I don't understand what you're doing. Messiah's word on the cross. One of the things he says on the cross in John 19, 28. Woman, behold your son. Behold, man, behold your mother. What's this about? Some people say in the Catholic Church, there are those, well, that means Mary's your mother. Well, then it would mean that John's our son, but that doesn't go. You know, he's saying something because he's leaving the world. He's going to be gone. How do you enter the Shabbat of God? He's tying up the loose ends. 
why you may not have peace is there are loose ends in your life that you never tied up. And you never tied it up with God. Maybe unfinished business you never did. Maybe something with your parents. Maybe something with another. Whatever. Maybe you, you wronged somebody and you never asked forgiveness. You never made it right. Well, part of entering the Sabbath is this. He's finishing up. Do you know, you can relate to this. You're going on vacation and it takes you like days to finish up in order to go on vacation. And it takes a lot of work to go on vacation. You know, there are times I remember, this, this just, it's, I don't know if the vacation was worth it, how much it took to get to that vacation and finish up. But if I didn't finish it up, I could never go. If you want to enter God's rest, then you, if there's unfinished business, you need to bring it to God and finish it up. You know, Zacchaeus, when he was saved, he didn't say, okay, I'm saved, so forget about everybody else. He said, okay, I'm going to go back to everybody, and I'm going to give them four times as much as I ripped them off for he was tying it up. This was a man who, who undoubtedly had peace. You ever leave home and you, and you think, you think, wait, well, there's something I left on or I left, there's something there. Something not, I left the light on. I left the oven on. I left the mixer. I left the machine on. I left the lawnmower on. And there's something there and you don't have peace because there's something unfinished. Maybe right now you have something at home and you have no peace. You can't have rest and peace until you can say goodbye, finish it up, wrap it up. If there's something in your life, wrap it up. Something gnawing on you, wrap it up. Some guilt, some shame, wrap it up with God. It's his. Messiah on the cross in Luke 23, 34, he said the most awesome words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here he is bleeding to death. They're killing him wrongly hating him, mocking him, degrading him, despising him. And what does he do? He asks for forgiveness for them. He's forgiving them. He didn't die with any grudges. He has forgiveness on those who are crucifying him and making him bleed to death and, and mocking him as he does. But what's he doing? He's entering the Shabbat, which teaches us something very important. How do you find peace in your life? You are not going to have peace if you don't forgive. You must forgive for your own sake, for their sake, for your sake. And some of you, and in the Lord, you still hold grudges. And as much as you do, you don't enter the kingdom. You don't enter the peace of God. You have grudges. You have, you're frustrated all the time. You're angry all the time. You are defrauding yourself of the peace of God. You're never going to have it until you let go of it. The unforgiving are the most peaceless people in the world. Restless, miserable. You're carrying a grudge. Know that it's like you're carrying poison in your body. He's forgiving the people who are crucifying him. If he could do that, you certainly can forgive the person who overlooked you or even betrayed you. There's nothing compared to what he did. You might say they're wrong, and you might be right, but drop it because God is right in judging you, but he dropped it. Pray for their blessing. You want peace in your life? Pray for their blessing and take action to bless them in some way. And sometimes if you, you know, sometimes you forgive somebody, but then it starts playing again and you get mad all over again. Well, know that it's a continual thing that starts coming back again. Lord, I want to be free. You know, people who are truly forgiving are joyous people. And I'm not saying people who are weak or people who just accept abuse because they think they should accept abuse. That's not forgiveness at all. Forgiveness is, no, you're wrong, but, I, but you know what? So was I before God. I have to forgive you, and I bless you. Forgiveness. You know that forgiveness is actually linked to healing? There are things that you may not be healed of until you ask forgiveness and forgive that person. You know, when the high priest had that scapegoat, and had to release the goat. He had to put his own sins on the goat and then release the goat with his sins. But he didn't just put his own sins, I mean symbolically. He had to confess the sins of the whole nation. Then release it. So he tells you something. If you don't release their sins, you're not releasing your sins. The goat is with you. You want to be released completely? Release and you'll be released. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Don't forgive. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You know, we're saved by grace. The Bible says if you don't forgive, you're not forgiven. That's pretty major. What else happened on that cross? How else did the Lord of the Sabbath enter the Sabbath and the peace of God? Luke 23, verse 39, he turns to the thief, turns to the criminal, 
and says, I tell you this day, you know, the, the criminal says, remember me, O Lord. He says, I tell you this day you will be with me in paradise. What does it tell you? I mean, you know, he's dying. He's in pain. You know, one of the things about being in pain, it's very hard when you're in pain to think about other people because you're so wrapped up in your pain. And that's physically true, but that's also true spiritually. If you live your life as a victim, you're wrapped up in your pain, and that is not, that is, that is, ends up, that's not godly, and it's selfish. If you're a victim, if everything is a victim, what they did to you, you are going to be wrapped up in you. But he doesn't get wrapped up in him. He doesn't, and he, and he has every right to be, he's God. But even he, on the cross, being crucified, is ministering to those near him. He's ministering a spirit of love. He is ministering to those in need. And one of the secrets of peace and blessing in your life simply is to bless others and forget about yourself. Get wrapped up in blessing others. And there is a release of burdens. You want to be blessed? You know, then you bless the poor. You take care of this. And then your life will be like a well-watered garden, says God. Then your light will shine. Bless. I mean, he can, here he is being crucified, being, being yelled at, being screamed at, being bleeding, and he, his eyes are off himself. He says, i got to bless this man here. Today I tell you, you will be with me in Paris. Get beyond yourself, and you can enter the Sabbath of God. Because he's the one who is beyond himself, and he is the, the greatest self, and yet he gets beyond it. He's, beyond, he's not even selfish. And another thing here. Messiah entered the Sabbath on the seventh day, when? He entered it when he finished the will of God. The Sabbath is entered when the will of God is done. The very first Sabbath ever in the cosmos happened when God finished the will of God. It's the first time the will of God was ever finished, and then comes the Sabbath. That tells you something. You can never enter the peace of God and the blessing and the healing and the fullness, the state of perfection God has until you do the will of God. In other words, if you're out of God's will, you can't have the peace of God. It's very simple. If there's something in your life that is out of God's will, you can't have the peace until you bring it to God and you finish it. And if God is calling you to do something now, don't put it off and seek all the other things. Just do what God says. If God is saying, share the gospel already with that person, share it, and you'll start having peace. But if you know something's the will of God and you're not doing it, you're not going to have peace. And if you're doing something that's not the will of God, you're not going to have peace either. You say, well, was well, that works? Well, listen, this is the Bible. No, it's grace. But grace leads us to repentance. What is God calling you to do? And I'm not talking about just what's he calling you to do in the big picture, which is great. That's the end of the story. Yes, but the big picture happens through little steps. Every day, the more you do the will of God every day, the more you're going to get to that place that God has for you. If you don't do the little things, you're not going to get to the big things. So what's God calling you to right now? I remember when Richard Wormrad shared the story about the woman who wanted to be a missionary her whole life, and she ended up getting swept up in love, and she married a man, didn't become a missionary. But the man turned out to be horrible. He was just bitter all the time. And she's saying, you know, she's praying to God, oh, Lord, why? Why? I wanted to serve. I wanted to minister. I wanted to go. I was going to go to, to the, you know, Africa. I was going to go to New Guinea. I was going to be ready to, to minister to the pagans and the, the barbarians. I was ready to do it. And she's always complaining before God. And then she hears the Spirit say, the barbarians in the living room. <laughs> minister to him. And she started truly. It changed her attitude. And he changed with it. But she wasn't doing the things, she, the little things she had to do right there and now. Do the thing you have to do now. It will lead to the big thing. It will lead to the great thing. But do what you know to do now. And the other thing about Messiah, what does he do on that cross? Here he is. I mean, it's the most earthly thing. I mean, you know, I can't even, can't even imagine. I mean, his heart is racing and pounding and suffocating and all these things happening. And yet he's thinking of paradise. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. And one of the keys also of entering the, that place with God is that no matter what happens, you keep your eyes on the eternal. No matter what you're going through, the, uh, look at the big picture, the eyes of, of God, and what, what is happening. You always look, just like, you know, Stephen is being stoned to death, and yet he looks and he sees God. And he's like in, he's like in, in ecstasy. I see God, he's standing in Messiah. 
No matter what, there's so many times you get wrapped up in your problem, and that's not God. You know, we address problems, but we don't get, we're not to get wrapped up. We're part of the answer, not part of the problem. I mean, some of you may be part of the problem, but we're supposed to be part of the answer. So therefore, the key is that even sometimes, you know, the, I, I think sometimes I said, you know what, I was dwelling on that problem. Why didn't I pray about it? That's happened a lot with me. I said, oh my goodness, I didn't pray about it. I'm thinking about it. Why, when I could be praying about it, she said, you know, like the V8 moment. I could have been praying about it instead of thinking it would be count as a prayer. You know, look to the answer at all things. Don't get so wrapped up. Look, look through it. No matter what's happening in your life, God has a purpose in it. There's an answer to it. Look to that. Lift up your eyes. My says, my, I lift up my eyes to the hills where, where my help comes from. There's no peace on dwelling on the problem. There's a lot of peace on dwelling on the answer. Messiah. And then what does he say? Key to the Sabbath of Messiah. He says in Luke 23, into your hands I commit my spirit. What's he doing? He's entering the Sabbath. He is entrusting, he is committing himself into the Father's hand. He's trusting. Some believers talk sometimes as if they run around or act as if they can't really trust God. If you're really trusting God, you couldn't be acting like that. But you'll never have peace until you come to the point where you trust God. You commit it to God with your problems. You know, when you pray, it says give thanks to God. Don't just keep telling the problem. There's a moment where you have to commit it and say, okay. I know I was, someone was telling me about a very famous minister in America but what, who knew, he knew him and was prayed with him. And the times that he just, they would pray, and the minister would say, okay, it's done. It's in his hands. Let's move on. And there's a thing about trust. You know, trusting God is it's an active thing. I will trust the Lord. It's something you choose, you commit to. And sometimes you have to labor to enter it, but you got to put the whole thing, Lord, I put it in your hands. It's your problem now. I remember, you know, the story of how everything happened with the harbinger. It was at, at the airport. And I remember I, had to com I committed it to God that moment. I committed, said, this is your thing, Lord. It's your responsibility, not mine. And I remember I felt, okay, it's his now. And at that moment, he began to fulfill it. I had to commit it. Your worries, you have to commit it to God. And, and if it comes back, do it again until you get used to keeping it on him. That's trust. Messiah is total committing into your hands, not my hands. I'm getting it out of my hands. Get it out of your hands. Into your hands, I commit my spirit, my life. And then finally, there he is on the cross, John 19, 30, and he says the words, it is finished. How did he enter the Sabbath? It is finished. You want to enter the Sabbath of God, of Messiah, this blessed place to dwell in? You have to be able to say, it is finished. In other words, it says there in writing Hebrews, for those who enter, they are no longer living in their works. They are living in God's work. In other words, I'm not living here to prove anything anymore. I'm not living even to try to live up to God's standards. I'm not even, that's not my main thing. That's not where the action is. I do, I am to go out all out in God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the ultimate thing is that God has done it, and in that work, I will move. We can never enter the Sabbath. If you're living in yourself, you're living, oh, I'm not complete. I got to do this, this. I got to get these people to like me. I got to get these people to recognize me. That you'll never have peace. And even if they like you, you'll never have peace. It doesn't mean anything anyway. It's based on it is finished. He did it. He finished the work. He finished me. He finished you. Messiah's word on the cross, it is finished. What was finished? Your sin was finished on the cross. If you're still living in it, you're not getting that. And yet the fact that in this cosmic reality, it is finished, somehow it is finished in him. And the more we get with the program, the more it starts becoming true in our life. The guilt is finished. The shame is finished. The failure that you never complete, you, what you didn't do, that's finished. You don't have to spend the rest of your life compensating for that. You know, what they did to you or what they, how they abandoned you or how they never loved you, that's finished. You don't have to live the rest of your life trying to make up for it. Or what you messed up or what you lost in your life, that's finished. It's gone. That's the whole point. Sin shall have no power over you. You're a new creation is what it says. It says if anyone's in Messiah, 
He is a new creation. The old has passed away. They go together. How are you going to walk in newness? As much as the old is finished. It says, reckon your old life dead and live in the newness of God. It goes together. He could not enter the Sabbath without finishing the old on the cross. It is finished. Just the way God entered on the very first Sabbath in Genesis. It says he finished. There's a secret in God of how to live in the finished work of God. We've shared some of this mystery in Hebrew. It's a timeless thing that what is yet to come in God is already done. That the past is already finished in Hebrew, in the Hebrew tense. The perfect tense in Hebrew is the finished tense. To live in perfection, you live in it is finished. That's why when you read Isaiah 53, and it's kind of strange, because if you notice, it speaks the first part as if it already happened, even though it was 700 years before. It's as if it was already done. Why? Because it's talking in the Hebrew perfect. It means it's a perfect work. It's already as good as done. Messiah's word on the cross, it is finished. I can never have God love me any more than now. I'm already, I've already arrived in God. It's already done. I, I don't have to spend my life compensating. It's done. Messiah's words on the cross are part of a profound mystery, not only of what he was ending, but where he was going. And it goes back to the mystery in Genesis when it says, God finished his works. And it says, then God, the seventh day, it says, God, actually at the end of the sixth day, God ceased from his works. The word is Shabbat, Sabbath, Shabbat. We get the word Sabbath from God's action of Shabbat. It becomes Shabbat. What does it mean? He ceased from his work, Shabbat. All over the world, the Orthodox Jews, they cease from their works, or they're supposed to. The ultimate Sabbath is the ultimate act of God ceasing. What is the cross? It is God ceasing. Shabbat. He dies. That's the ultimate ceasing. God dies on the cross. It is God. Shabbat. The old is gone. And what does it say? You want to enter that place that's greater than any place on earth. That place you have to also Shabbat. You have to cease to the old. Surrender. Let go of. Cease. From your works, okay, that's not my work anymore. God took it. It's not my work. It's not even my life anymore. My old life isn't even me anymore. I'm ceasing. The old is over. Amazing thing. You know, the Orthodox every week, they try to enter the Sabbath. They light the candle. They do all the things, finish up, say the right prayers. But only Messiah can truly show us how to enter the Shabbat. Messiah is the Lord of it. Dying to the old that he can enter the new. Only in that, Mashiach, it says, let us labor to enter this, which means we're probably not used to really resting in our hearts, but God has this thing for us to come into. It's no accident that he died when he did, but it's even more than that. Look at that. It's really cool. He died. He stopped working just when the Sabbath was coming. That's what you have to do. But, you know, so you can say he died because the Sabbath was coming, but it's even more cosmic than that. He didn't stop his works and say it is finished because the Sabbath was coming. Rather, he died so the Sabbath could come. He said it is finished so the Sabbath could come. If he died on Tuesday morning, that would become the Sabbath. If he died on Wednesday night, that would be the Sabbath. You know, because the point, the ultimate mystery of the Sabbath is not just a time. That, yeah, it's a time in the physical, but it's deeper than that. It's an act of God. The first Sabbath was God did something, and that caused the Sabbath to come. He rested. He finished. We rest in Messiah. And what it's saying is it doesn't matter what day it is, and I'm not getting into the controversy of the Sabbath. It's not about that. It's deeper. It doesn't matter what day it is. We're supposed to be in the Sabbath of God every moment. It's supposed to be, thank God, it's Friday every moment. You know, it's not about, well, I'm waiting when things get right, so that's where you never get it. When this gets right, when this gets right, when I have this, when I have this more money, when I have, then, I'll, then, I'll be, then I'll be cool, then I'll arrive. No. It's not based on the circumstance. It's based on the act of God. What's saying is no matter what's going on in my life, the act of God is bigger. What God has done is greater. The Sabbath of God is unconditional no matter what I'm going through. It's peace, it's joy, it's, uh, it's the day of arrival. It's the weekend. 
You know, that's what the Sabbath's about. The week's over. Remember the key. Come as you are. Bring everything to God. Finish up the loose ends. Forgive them. Love even those who come against you and they won't be your enemy. Keep your eyes on heaven. Trust the Lord in all things. Commit to him everything. Declare it done, done, done. It's a done deal. I'm in, a, I'm in the finished work of God now. And cease to the old let go. And one last thing. You cannot enter the Sabbath of Messiah without the Messiah of the Sabbath. And what that saying is, you know, that's the problem. That's what Orthodox Jews need. They're missing one thing. They're missing the Lord of the Sabbath. So they never really have the Sabbath. And for 2,000 years, the Jewish people haven't had any Sabbath. They've been running all the time because there's been no peace. Israel has no peace. What's the key? Do everything with him. The only way you can enter that place is with him. He did it with us on the cross. We need to do it with him in our life. Do nothing alone. Everything you're doing, bring him into it. Whatever you're doing, bring him into it. You say, well, what if I'm sinning? Bring him into it. It'll stop your sin. You're not going to be able to do it with him there. Learn the secret of moving as he moves, living in his living, resting in his rest, letting go in his letting go, being complete in his completion, finishing in his finishing, being blessed in his blessing. The Sabbath of Messiah. For there yet remains for you a Sabbath, a Shabbat of God that is greater than anything that went before, a place of complete.